I would like to say that it's a real pleasure to be here and discover all the passionate people. I mean, I was just offline for about two hours when I opened my WhatsApp. There were 29 new messages. So yes, it's very exciting. I can feel the energy. So, Steffi contacted me and said, you know, we really like you to come and, and talk to us a little bit about how a futurist work. And this is perhaps one of the most uh, regular questions I get. So what exactly is it that you do? I actually almost have, uh, I'm running up to my fourth decade and as futurist, in order to make sense of the future, and I decided it might be a good practice to make sense of my own future, I look back to look forward. And this is the result, a timeline of almost four years of working, playing, thinking like a futurist. I'm going to show you some shaps, sna not shaps, not, uh, snapshots of my journey. So I started out in design, this is me up there in Denmark in 1988. And after four years, I was just about 25, I moved to Hamburg. I stayed there for four years and eventually about 33 years ago, I moved to London where I started a, a little studio, a cross collaborative forum where we have already then moved from design into actually understanding what happens before you make good design. And the idea was design of anything. Now, I also along the way uh, developed the futurist Trend Toolkit, which I will talk a little bit about in a second. It was actually a project in 2003 where Toyota asked me to come and help them create a map of the future, looking 30 years into the future. It was a tall order, but really interesting. And now, of course, after writing a book about how to, you know, trend management, I'm now here in this position that I have decided to try on a mission to teach the whole wide world to think, work and play like futurists. And it's really important to understand that when you look into the future, you need a very simple toolkit because when we navigate complexity and the tools we are using become too complex, it becomes a very, very hard journey. Somehow we are all futurists now, right or wrong. Because we are here, because we all have a passion about the future, we want to make a difference. I think all of you here are active change makers. You know that it starts with the power of one. Everything starts with an idea. You ask CEOs around the world, four in five CEOs today say that they spend more time looking into foresight and scenario work. And I think it's inspirational to hear that, but what is actually happening? Foresight is powerful and it's also integral to innovation and giving everyone in the community a voice. We need to get everyone to sit around the table in order to shape a more collaborative, inclusive future. This is the future of everything in New York. It's an annual event, the Wall Street Journal. They invite everybody. You can think about this inspirational. I mean, CEOs, experts, rapper, I think Snoop Dogg has been there too. Kim Kardashian, Rick Rubin, they're all on the list. And why is that so important to notice? Well, we all remember the TED Talks. It was revolutionary. Today, we are all listening, watching, reading widely. And why is that? Because we are all connected and sharing. So how do I make an A4 summary of the future? How you do it? This is how you do it, a very simple map Looking back to look forward, a lot of people say, and I know that, you can't look back to look forward. Of course you can. We draw a 150 years sort of picture of the future, the past, present and future, and we start with the first 100 years because immediately all of the signposts post of the successes and also the failures, as Steffi mentioned, they would be on there. And then when we have those horizon scans in order, we start to do interviews, we scan. The scanning of trends is an ongoing project. It never starts. It's, it's a really about creating organic roadmaps of the future. So those are the four P roadmaps. I'll get to them in just a second. 
But the most important thing about navigate the future, navigating the future, do you know what that is? Asking good questions. And I'm sure, Casper, you know that. And by the way, I saw your work with the donut economics. I can't wait. I got a little snapshot on that. And I think that you even know more about that. So I'm looking forward to speak after the break. Asking good questions is also about understanding what landscape are we actually going to navigate. We have to think multidimensional. If you've ever seen any of my TED Talks, you will always hear me speak about whole brain thinking because for far too long we have banked on left brain thinking only. Many city planners, CEOs, many organizations only focused on the capital P for profit. But of course, then there was the talk about people, planet, and profit. I think we have to say balancing people and planet with a purposeful ethos to match feeding into our environment. That's key to sustainable development, and it's also key to sustainable performance and resilient cities. So really, this idea of activating and balancing left and right brain problem-solving skill. That's how you open up to curiosity and creativity. And we need that. We need those left-brainers and right-brainers to sit around the table and create good stories and maps of the future. So this map, actually, the toolkit here, Postcards from the Future, looks like this. Come and have a look at it. I, I brought a few boxes, but I just wanted to say this is an ongoing map. It's basically a blueprint of how you all can start to think, work, and play like futurists. This is our essential toolkit. It contains the core building blocks of the future. And instead of just because I have the design background, I'm not really good with pastel analysis. Most of you know those. Politics, economic, societal trends, technology, environment, and legislation, all very good. But it's about data that you measured in the past. There are no evidence for the future because it hasn't happened yet. But we can start to see the first you know, signpost. And also understanding people and new ways of living. But what is the sort of things beyond that, the sort of socio-cultural drivers that actually make us get up in the morning and go to work? We have to tap into people's emotional dimension and the spiritual dimensions because that's where the values lives, our needs and wants and our dreams. So looking into society drivers, my team and I, uh, Harold here, uh, the architect futurist, the design futurist in Copenhagen, and Sina, my economic thinker, my economic futurist, says, I don't know anything about trends. She's actually one of our best researchers because we trained her to think out of the box. We put together this little risk and opportunity map because very often we tend to be reactive when we speak about the future, but we have to be proactive. And all it takes is to make across what are the rational drivers, what are the emotional values, a bit of economics and meconomics, and then you can start to draft your own risk and opportunity map. I have here eight big macro trends. I place them on four postcards on the future, one for each of the P's. So let's get started. The four P lens is essential to think out of the box. 95% of people worldwide believe that it is essential for global cooperation to build a better future for everyone. And that's according to data from UNESCO. And I believe that lifelong learning is how we understand the world we live in, but it also gives us tools to think and thrive and innovate out of the box. I'm sure that there might be a few of the Danish people here who know this lady, Carla Camilla Jord. She founded or co-founded a real entrepreneur who worked in culture and arts, co-founded Space 10 about 10 years ago. But after a decade of innovating and thinking different about the future, they closed down the lab. Uh, one of the best things she did was she said, I have an idea for the future. Let's just take it to a big corporation who got the power to support me. So she took it to IKEA. And over 10 years, they have helped co-create ideas for the future. Resilient cities is one of them. There's still some great example on the website here, the solar village and this, I love this, it's a flat pack idea for housing in the favelas. I think it's from South America. So of course, it hasn't been rolled out, but the thinking out of the box is what makes it so inspiring. 
And it's also about diversity, because if there's just a few very similar people like you and me, I always get into bored and talking to people who think like me and I get like confirmation. But sometimes you have to also get the people who don't agree in anything you say, set them around the table, let's agree on what we disagree on and then let's get started. And research shows that cultivating curiosity and openness to new ideas can actually boost resilience and also the bottom line inside organizations. And I think that's why this is such a worthwhile story to tell in Denmark, and I don't know for those of you, I mean, probably Casper would know that, um, that they had the first, world's first innovation lab, a cross ministerial innovation lab called Mind Lab. They closed it down, I have no idea why, I would have actually continued it. But sometimes it's good to close down a gig while it's still going really well. And again, I just want to say it's about people, it's about learning societies, and about urban living labs. And we'll see more of this around the world. Casper's laughing now, I can see it. So it's just because Casper is actually the only one, and Thomas, I can see here because the light is really strong. He's the expert, he's the one you're going to talk to afterwards. But I believe in new models and economics for humans because growing urbanization in the EU might double the size of global building stock by, not in the, by, by, by I'll just say that again. Growing urbanization in the EU. EU might double the size of building stock by 2060. And as we, most of us know, building has a huge impact on the environment. Love this case study from Amsterdam, 2018. They wanted to create a new map for success, a map. And they wanted to go beyond traditional economic measure, the capital P, profit, and everything you can measure. They wanted to really engage and open up uh, to new ideas for the future. So they invited the British economist Kate Ravers, who is basically really renowned for her book, Donut Economics, How to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. And in collaboration with her and a group of really inspiring people, they became the world's first donut city in 2020. And since then, of course, a lot of people have followed trade. So who's next on the list, who I find inspirational, uh, is basically the city of Helsinki. Um, I've had the pleasure to be there many times. I love working with uh, the people up in, in, in Finland because they think very different. So I work with the likes of Nokia. I've worked with lots of different organizations, also public sectors. But what is interesting, also work in Iceland, working in Norway and in Copenhagen. In fact, I don't live in Copenhagen. I live in London and around the world. So I'm a real, true global digital citizen. But on one of my Finnish uh, expeditions, I found out that also not only are they, you probably know this, the world's happiest uh, nation seven consecutive years, but they're also one of Europe's most digitally advanced economy. But they don't just have all of that rationale and technology, they also understand the importance of culture and they actually brought sauna culture back in on the map because even though there's three and a half million people in Finland, about four and a half million saunas, I don't know families having more saunas, <laughs> The public saunas were closing down, and this is really where many of the interesting ideas and business meeting took place because there's a limit to how much golf you can play because of the long windows up there. So they took the things into the saunas. Now, many ideas have ha happened there. You might know that they're also well known for the educational model. Seven universities joined up uh, to become Alto University uh, several years back. But what I found was the most interesting case study I've read, and I've met the uh, former minister of Estonia, prime minister. Estonia, which is the world's most digitized government in the world, joined for forces with the Finland in 2018 to share cross-border health data so people from Estonia could easily travel to Finland and stay, and vice versa. That has been a very interesting journey. 2022, Finland had the highest score on the DESI index, which is Digital Economic and Society Index, and they ranked first in human capital component. And Denmark was actually ranked first for its 
connectivity. So this is just showing that digital inclusion can transform cities at system level. They have another system where they involve the citizens in sharing data so they can actually distribute uh, resources and assets uh, in the best possible way. Now, finally here in my little journey, I thought I would also refer a little bit to um, Singapore. It was with the great honor that I was asked by the gov Singaporean government to sit on the international expert of board. So you will have the scenario planners uh, from IBM and also uh, the shell scenario planners. You will have Orop. Uh, there was another very exciting person from uh, Hong Kong, Rebecca, who was in charge of all the public housing over there. Jennifer, another Jennifer, surprise, surprise, from Canada. I think she was running for mayor, so she missed one of the meetings. But that diversity of thinking and thoughts, and also somebody who had written a book about, I think, um, something poll, a, a poly, uh, it was about the economy of airports, because it's a great one in Singapore. But really, AI will play a crucial role in achieving global well-being, and data ethics, of course, and good governance is needed in order to make this happen. This is a little mapping project that we made with um, the top team, 40 people at the OECD. And I wanted to just share it with you that when you do maps of the future, it's not all happening on Zoom. It's about getting it out in the real world, you know, mapping the trends and using trends from the, the trend atlas, the postcards, cards. We always have some blank cards in the back. So if you think something is missing, create your own wild cards and put them on there. This is the result of a two-day workshop. But the most important thing is to understand that the future is not just somewhere we go, we create it. And we constantly update and overlook that the maps that we have created are fantastic. And speaking of maps, Singapore's digital twin uh, of the entire nation is really what I find so exciting. The digital twin as well in Finland. In fact, 500 cities are working on digital twin uh, mapping. And I think this is really how we can improve, let's say, in f especially in Singapore, thermal comfort. Heats are staggering. I mean, if you go out in the morning after 7 o'clock in the morning in Singapore, it's really, really difficult to endure. So they use it in city planning, and I see there is a huge future potential there to use new technology to create, I would say, more global resilience, but also for regenerative practices. I mean, I have great hope in AI and digital twin twins. Now, who are the people that would be living, let's say, in Singapore in 50 years? I thought I would let you meet the next generation futurist, uh, story tell the future. And it's actually recorded in uh, your, the urban redevelopment offices in Singapore. And this is a little kind of like a, a kind of a, a, a mock-up of the entire city and nation. This is where all the IPE meetings uh, were held in the past. So lean back and listen to what those futurists here are telling about the future. <coughs> Singapore would be like in the future? I think that the atmosphere will be very different from today's atmosphere. So there are leaves and trees everywhere to reduce the greenhouse effect. This is a water playground. If floods come, you can still play in it. <laughs> so there are bubbles to protect them from any floods or anything. So even if it floods, it will affect the outside. So the green patches around the bubbles show that they are eco-friendly and they are like the, the creepers or vines. It should be a little more open. So they can change the roof. Up here, we can also grow some food. There will be like little herb gardens and farming areas and fruit trees.
This is the robot and this is the lady. The, the robot is going to take the lady wherever she wanna go. Is the lady on um, sitting on a on a floating yeah. device? Yeah. I think it will be easier for us because there's like no traffic in the sky and they can just move wherever they want to. They will follow them. I vision Singapore as a very multi uh, culture place mm. and it's also a very tech place, yeah. so they'll invent these type of houses which are floating. Yeah. Where do we think people will work in the future? I think they will work underground mm -hmm. or sometimes in the sky. This is um, solar powered. It will absorb the moonlight mm. to also run. I see, so it will be hovering above ground 24-7. Yeah. I think that, oopsie, so we have another one, but yeah, I think this is interesting to see these little young kids, they haven't gone to school for many years yet, and they're not con completely corrupted, they haven't learned to count all the things that don't, doesn't really count, so they are spontaneous, creative and curious, and I really like that. So to round off my presentation, I thought I would, and you will have my presentation if you want to, create a little 4P forecast. Urban Resilience Roadmap, it contains some of the trends I talked about, but also the values. And there are four key takeaways, which most of you are probably already practicing, but just in case you've forgotten, remember to be the human interface, because inclusion and digital integrity foster transparency and trust. Build strong alliances. We're here to do this today, tomorrow, and next few days because learning organization, learning cities promotes diversity to enhance agile innovation. Build resilient ecosystems because sustainable living and participation encourage more and more of us, especially the young citizens of the future, to do the right things. And really finally drive systemic transformation because it's when we raise our system awareness levels that we can engage in a much deeper way and I could talk to forever about radical systemic change which is some of the keys that I hear out there everybody's talking about that and really the future is now we all have a vested interest in the future and really resilient futures of tomorrow, uh, resilient cities, will be the one that are basically as passionate about the four Ps as I am, and of course maybe add places and passion and you have the whole future building blocks. Uh, so enjoy and please come and talk to me after the break. Thank you.